welcome to a uh, trail trimming episode uh, of Trail Building 101. Uh, if you can see behind me, uh, the river is quite swollen. It rained all day today, like cats and dogs. The trails are really too wet to ride. It's spring. It's actually kind of late spring. It's early June here in Toronto. The greenery is exploding. I don't know if you can see it behind me. And so up until like two weeks ago, you could basically ride all the trails with the sight lines completely open. All of a sudden, we're getting greened out. There are a couple reasons why you want to trim that back. First, you want to open up those sight lines. Um, obviously, when you're going really fast, you want to be able to see as far down the trail as possible, as do the people coming the other way. And the other thing is by cutting back uh, the greenery, you're basically allowing the sun and the wind to penetrate the trail which means the trails will dry out sooner and uh, get back to riding as soon as possible. Doing, doing this right after a rain is that the leaves are at their heaviest. So they're actually weighing in and you get a really good sense of, you know, where the, the leaves are on the trail and where you need to cut back. I use these. So these are anvil cutters. Basically these are pruners with an anvil like Plate. So this blade comes down onto this, like onto an anvil, okay? So if you can imagine just smashing onto that. Now I prefer this type of snip to this. This is a bypass snip. And here you can see the blade actually passes, it bypasses this, it doesn't hit the anvil, it goes past it. But the problem is, is once you start putting a thicker branch in there, what ends up happening is the physics want to drive these apart. And it ends up putting a huge amount of pressure on this and I find ultimately that's where these fail but maybe my go-to is just this up this one is a silky which I have found um, I'm just test driving this one now I've had it for a couple months I'm going to be doing a review on it I have found it to be phenomenal it cuts through things like nobody's business you can basically grab whatever it is you want and it's almost like slicing its throat it's a very satisfying motion of decapitating plants the other nice thing about this is it does perform like a machete, so it just cuts really nicely. So if you want to cut things back really quickly as you're walking, you know, you see things, you just cut things back like this, and it works pretty damn well. And then that slitting of the throat thing I was talking about, oh yeah, you're dead. And here you just cut things back. So I find I probably use this more than any other tool. And if I were to have just one tool for pruning back things, it would be the pruning saw because then of course if you run into other things you can uh, say like branches and that sort of stuff with the hand saw i can deal with this rather quickly if i only had the hand pruner i would be in for more of a, a a thing but the nice thing about the silky saw is they come in boom done i put it in my holster can't recommend the holster enough it's just so quick so easy the wonderful thing about the loppers, aside from the fact that they've got really good reach, you can see I'm like three feet from the tree, it, but it's of course the leverage that you get with this. So if you wanna like, you know, chop something really big or a branch with relatively no effort, say like this one, which I wanna remove anyways, I come in here, I put in the lopper and literally with not even making a fist down the, you know, snippy goes the branch. So the loppers are pretty good. Um, they're not a one size fits all because like here it's like, oh, I'm going to snip everything when it would be easier just to do this. Of course, that's not what I do. Everything works great. It really comes down to kind of probably what foliage you're dealing with. I have to imagine if you're in the desert and you're dealing with cacti, you're probably not using a hand pruner. You're probably using, I don't know, dynamite. I don't know. Yo, desert builders, let me know what you use to cut back cactus. <laughs> You can see here like there's the tree and it's reaching it's reaching out a good seven feet here to basically impede our view right what we want to be able to do here is see through this corner so we're going to come in here we're going to walk around this one's in our way but it's not in the trail way so we're just going to move that one out of the way and we're going to come in here and we're going to cut this back and that's already going to open up so much of the sight line but this guy's also in the way so we're gonna take it off too. All right, 
And now we go back to our position and look at that sight line. It's nice and clear. And we've really opened all this up on both sides. And even though none of those green things were gonna hurt you, you ride differently because of them. You just naturally wanna slow down when you come into an area like this that's overgrown. All of a sudden, especially when you're going fast, the trail's gonna get really narrow. Now it's fine here when you're on a flat piece of terrain like this, but when things all of a sudden start changing underneath you, say like this berm corner, you're not gonna wanna drive your wheel in here when there's all this grass here, because in your brain, your, the, the fear part of your brain is telling you there could be a stump in there, there could be a rock in there, who knows, a branch, maybe some sort of monster. Uh, so by opening up these corners, it's gonna allow you and everybody else to ride through them much faster. It's a real kind of mind fuck. And I know it looks like I cut things really back like this, right? Like, you know, all of a sudden there's probably eight feet between those two trees there. But the trails just naturally get narrower the faster you go. So you wanna cut things back quite a bit. And at the same time, the further back you do it, the less frequent you have to do it. Everything's trying to grow to in the center of this trail because that's where the sunlight is. That's what they want to do. They want to come to the open area where the sunlight is and grow. We want the opposite of that. You can just imagine how difficult it would be for sun to find the bottom of this, you know, this trail tread here, as well as for wind to pass through here. So here you can actually see the wind coming through here. Here there's no trees, okay? Lots, it's very open. And you can see the grass really blowing around. Okay, lots of movement here. But if you look further down the trail, where the dog is headed, you'll see because the trees are there, there's a lot less movement. There is a real benefit to opening things up, allowing sunshine to come down and wind to come through. One of the things you can do with your trail building powers is you can also use them for, I don't know if it's evil or good, Let's say that everybody was shortcutting it here on the right, and I wanted everybody to go to the left. What I can then do while I'm trimming back the trail is I can leave the brush on the right. And people, like, trust me, people are not gonna go through the brush. They're gonna take the path of least resistance. It works. People go where you direct them most of the time. Some of the time they don't, and it drives me crazy. That's basically the kind of the how to trim back your trail 101. I guess it's more trail maintenance than it is trail building, but it's really essential that you do it. Uh, and again, I think the best time to do it is when the trail is just at peak green, just after a rain. So all that moisture is weighing down those leaves. And then that way you have a really good sense of how much the trail is being encroached upon by uh, the vegetation. If you have any questions, um, if you have any other tips, please, by all means, feel free to share with me. I'd love to know. And as always, thanks for watching. See you on the trails.